Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. How is Haiti recovering from the horrific January 12, 2010 earthquake? What are some of the other challenges confronting this Caribbean country? We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other issues. Welcome back to our program. Today we're taking a look at Haiti, a country that was in the news back in 2010 for, for many, many months. We're going to take a look at how Haiti is recovering from the horrific earthquake that struck it on January 12th in 2010. My guest today is someone who's very knowledgeable of Haiti and this situation. My guest today is Dr. Francois Pierre-Louis. Dr. Francois Pierre-Louis is Haitian, a Haitian national, and is the Associate Professor of Political Science at Queens College, CUNY. Dr. Francois Pierre-Louis' research interests include immigration, transnationalism, and Haitian politics. He's worked as a community organizer in Haiti and the United States, and he served in the private cabinet of President Jean Bertrand Aristide in 1991. Dr. Francois Pierre-Louis, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate you being with me today. Haiti is a country that's a tremendous, of tremendous interest to people in our area of the world, but around the world, too, I think, to, to many people. We think about Haiti, it's a country of about 27,000 square kilometers, to roughly 10,000 square miles, about 10.3 million people. It occupies one-third of Hispaniola. The Dominican Republic is on the other two-thirds of Hispaniola. Mm. Let's talk about that day in January 12th, 2010. You were in Haiti when that horrific 7.8 earthquake struck uh, Port-au-Prince. Uh, very briefly, how, how did you cope with that? You and the people in Haiti, given that something like 85% 80, of the buildings were destroyed in the capital. Well, you know, it was really, um a shocking uh, thing to, uh, to have been in the earthquake and to survive it. Because the first day was horrible in terms of all the deaths and the destruction, and also the lack of uh, government support, given the fact that most of the uh, functionaries also died in the uh, earthquake. A lot of the buildings, public buildings uh, collapsed, mm -hmm. communications were cut off, and uh, but the most interesting thing about it was the fact that people came together to help, especially d during, the, during that night when everyone was sleeping outside, outdoor, people were afraid to go inside. And you had bodies all over the streets and people came together, just spontaneously organized themselves to put the bodies on one side to do a tri triage of people who were wanted, trying to help them, building makeshift tents and trying to bring water, water and food. That was really amazing to see how in the midst of this, everybody came together as one to help each other. Mm -hmm. And it was estimated something like over a quarter million people died, 250,000, and over 1.3 million people were left homeless yes. and had to live in the streets. How do you confront a situation where it's just rubble, more rubble and more rubble, and no place to find shelter. Of course, you had some of the United Nations agencies there helping. You had non-governmental organizations. But how did, how did people survive for that? Well, first, you know, the UN agency also was very affected by it. Yes, Because the was. whole building collapsed while the UN was having a meeting at, at that time, around 5 o'clock. So therefore, you really didn't have any coordinating agency. Only a few of the UN personnel that, that was there still remain to help. But I think what happened is that at the beginning, the hotels, some hotels that were not affected, people went there and they had food. They kind of distributed some of the food. You have other places where people, they had um, rice depot or food depot, water uh, storage somewhere. They came out and distributed those things free of charge. They didn't charge people around th that time. But one of the worst uh, memory I, I have in my mind is the fact, is the wailing and the crying and the uh, mm -hmm. and, and also the hurt and the fact that you you know the the most teaching element for me was that we are human we think we are powerful 
we can do anything. And suddenly you realize you are powerless. Mm -hmm. There's such a powerlessness in the midst of every possibility. I had next to me a doctor and children were coming hurt. He couldn't give them a, a, even an aspirin. He couldn't do anything. Suddenly you realize being a doctor doesn't mean much if you don't have the support system and the infrastructure to help out. So it shows the vagality of the human being and the fragility of the human being as such. <laughs> and um, it's really a horrible memory sometimes when it comes to my mind again. I can yeah. well imagine, yes. And of course, the uh, so many commentators, so many of the media people who were there talked about the resiliency of the Haitian people and their uh, ability to try to bounce back from this horrible disaster. I guess while you were there, did you see a lot of what we call, quote, profiles in courage, unquote, where people were doing sort of superhuman things to try to provide assistance? Yes. In fact, um, the third day after we didn't, I didn't stay anymore in the hotel, sleeping in the courtyard mm -hmm. because I couldn't stay in the hotel. I, I was sleeping in the courtyard with everybody else in the car. So we decided, my friends and I decided to go out there to help out. So we went to f get water food to distribute to other centers. As I was doing that, I met people that whom I knew before who were organizing their neighborhoods. And one guy came over to me, and that was really shocking. He said, you know, my mother la is laying right down there dead. And he was busy himself organizing the rest of the neighborhood. This was so amazing to me to see here's a guy in the midst of that painful moment, not thinking about his own self, but taking care of other people who were there trying to bring them food, clothes, because a lot of people lost everything, completely everything. They had no clothes, no food, no toothbrush, nothing at all to take up. And, that, and they didn't know when the help was coming because the whole country was practically shut down. Mm, exactly, and yeah. a large part of the infrastructure had been destroyed. Yeah. The crane at the port, the yeah. National Palace collapsed. And yeah, yes. Parliament building. The president himself was at his house and his house mm -hmm. collapsed also. So everything was um, in complete chaos. Mm -hmm. And of course, we think back to that period too, the media came in, CNN was one of the first to come into that area. The, there's a, an effect they call the CNN effect. When CNN and the media come in, they, they shine the spotlight yeah. on a tragedy and, and on people and the resiliency of the people and what have you, but then they leave. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How, how long did the CNN effect last in Haiti as far as actually yeah. getting some media coverage which produced a lot of assistance from people around the world. That's right. I think CNN lasts uh, more than two or three months. Mm -hmm. And Anderson was there himself, and several other CNN reporters were there. They were lodging at the Holiday Inn, which was the, uh, the Plaza Hotel. And they were giving reports everywhere. And I think they brought a lot of worldwide attention to the plight mm -hmm. of the uh, uh, situation of the Haitian people. And the help, I think the amount of aid that came in, in terms of donors giving money to various institutions, and the big UN meeting that took place uh, in March 31st uh, to discuss how they were going to support and rebuild Haiti was the effect of the CNN. Mm -hmm. And I think afterward, even after two months after, CNN continued to do reporting and send its uh, you know, various other reporters there to do spot checking on different things. So that really brought a lot of attention to the, uh, and also it exposed a lot of the issues that people were not aware of going on in Haiti such as the lack of um, uh, transparency and a lot of projects that were being made in Haiti, the fact that Haiti did not have a good infrastructure to uh, deal with crises like this, and also issues of governance. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It, it, what is the current status of Haiti? It's been well over five years ago that this disaster happened. How is Haiti today? If we, someone went to Port-au-Prince, what would that person find? Well, if you were to go to Port-au-Prince today, you, would, you wouldn't see that many people living in tents anymore. From 0.5 million people living in tents to maybe less than 300,000 today. So therefore there's been a big progress in terms of relieving, taking people off the tents and either encouraging them to move back in their neighborhoods or building new infrastructure for them. If you were to go back also, you would see that when uh, the earthquake happened in 2010, we did not really have two or three good international hotels. Today we have a lot of hotels that are taking place. However, what you, you will see though, is that you will see big empty space where the rubber, rubbers were taken off, were discarded, but there has not been any construction, any real co construction in housing or public uh, buildings, even though 
Haiti got almost five billion dollars for the reconstruction, but you don't really see in a tangible way how that money was spent and who spent it. So therefore, you see pockets of poverty, you see uh, whole places that are deserted because there is no one living there, the buildings were, uh, had collapsed, but you will go downtown, basically it's a ghost town, because the, the promise to rebuild that the town down has not been kept up to do. But it, it is far different than the country after the earthquake. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly is. And what are, now Haiti is, as I recall, it's the most dense, it's one of the most densely populated countries in the Western Hemisphere anyway. Yes. And it's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. What, what are some of the other challenges confronting Haiti? Are they primarily economic or are there, is there a multitude of other challenges? Every country has yes. challenges. Yeah. But wh what's confronting Haiti right now? Well, I think we have three major issues. Governance is one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, we started to have a transition to democracy since 1986, and we've never really completed that transition. We've had a number of coup and U.S. occupation or U international occupation since 1986. We've never had the regular elections, so we have a, a peaceful transition of power. In fact, we're having elections this year, but we still, you know, there's still doubts about how it's going, the outcome is going to, to take place. And then the economic situation is tied to the governance. Well, no one will invest in a country that is where you cannot have a right to your property, where the judicial system doesn't work, where you, the infrastructure does, is, is outdated, and the laws itself regarding investments are quite outdated. In fact, we are still dealing with laws that were set passed in the 1930s. You know, in, when it comes to electronic uh, signature, when it comes to new ways of looking at the uh, relationship between business and, and the property and the population, we are, haven't been able to initiate new laws. And the other thing also that has happened in terms of the economy, the world has changed. Haiti used to be a commodity type, type of economy where, you know, agriculture, coffee, cocoa, tobacco, were the kind of products we would send out and then bring in the money in. But the world has changed, you know, now. So you have to go into the industrial industries, and we haven't done that. So as a result, because of the rising population that are depleting the natural resources, cutting down the trees, the environment has degraded a lot. Every time it rains in Haiti, it, it floods because there are no more trees to absorb the water. Then you have people not willing to work in the agricultural sector anymore because they're not, uh, no, it's not you know, profitable to them. And then combined with the political situation, then it creates a really disaster for the whole country. And um, even though I the UN has been there for almost 10 years now, and they've tried to bring in some governance structure, but the UN has been tested in how, whether it can really achieve mm -hmm. such objective in Haiti. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is an independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would encourage our viewers to go to www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous shows and also to offer suggestions on future speakers and topics. Today we're taking a look at Haiti and how Haiti is bouncing back from the horrific earthquake that struck it on January 12th, 2010. My guest today was in Haiti on that date and is very knowledgeable of the country. My guest today is Dr. Francois Pierre-Louis, who is an Associate Professor of Political Science at Queens College, CUNY. We're talking about Haiti and the, the you mentioned a minute ago about the environmental devastation that's taken place in Haiti. If you fly yeah. from the Dominican Republic yes. across the border, and people, many people have seen this shot, I'm sure, mm -hmm. was green verdant on the Dominican side and the hills have been denuded, the trees have been chopped down. Is, is Haiti a microcosm? There are, there are many around the world, like Bangladesh is one of the most densely populated countries. Mm -hmm. It floods periodically. It is supposed to lose 20 to 25 percent of its land by 2050 due to climate change and rising seas. But is Haiti a, a sort of a microcosm of overpopulation, uh, too, uh, too many people in too small of a place, and which many countries are moving towards. Mm. It's not just Haiti, but many are moving toward. Of course, that ties right into climate change yeah. and producing more of a carbon footprint, which creates more mm. climate change. Is, do you see that as a microcosm, or are there things that could be done to help Haiti deal with this environmental disaster and to not worry about so many people in a small area? Yeah. Well, I think it's, I, I wouldn't say it's so much because of the population growth. Because if you look at Haiti compared to Taiwan, 
they are more or less have the same physical geographical space and look at you know no one can say because of the population of Taiwan Taiwan mm -hmm. is poor I think it's more of a question of governance in the sense that um, Haiti historically uh, uh, the French when they came in they cut down they began to cut the hardwood trees to make furniture to send to mm -hmm. Europe so there has been a history of the deforestation in Haiti and secondly the previous Duvalier government in order to get rid of its uh, opponents and enemies used to cut down forests because thinking that these people would be living in the forest so therefore there was this license to just cut down trees in order to prevent the opposition from organizing from that and they made a lot of money out of the hardwood forest they were selling abroad. And third, there, is no there wasn't any environmental policy for reforestation to manage the land well and also to decide where to plant, where to, uh, to do agriculture and where not to do it. So I think the problem with Haiti right now, it's a question of management. Uh, first, it's the authority of the state. Do you really have a state? Because whenever you have crisis, you have coup upon coup every year, every six months. So anyone who comes in, try to take as much as possible from the state and not thinking about the future because they're not going to be there for a long time. And secondly, it's a question of, you know, how do you train your population? Education is very important. Most um, uh, the literacy rate in Haiti is very low. There are more illiterate people in Haiti than you have people can read and write, even though we've had several programs, but they, they failed because the government really did not pay attention to it. So I think it's a question of also population growth has to do with economic situations. The better person off is off, the less likely that person will have more children. So therefore, it's uh, education combined with policy that will change these things. And I think it's possible to do that because, if you, as you said, if you look at the Dominican Republic, they, they have the same ecosystems. So if you manage it, then Haiti can regain some of this land and the environment that it has lost due to over either population or lack of governance. Mm -hmm. And in many countries, they undertake programs to plant trees. Is that possible? Is that happening in Haiti now? Yes, that has been going on for a long time. But the issue, uh, the, the biggest issue, that's why it comes back to governance also. It's a question of land tenure. Mm -hmm. We've had histories of peasants planting trees. And then when the trees are ready to ripe and the owner comes by and says, OK, I gave you this land to work on, but it's not your land. Now give me back my land. So the peasants, the poor farmers will not plant trees on land that they know the owner will come back and recuperate. So you have to have a way to say to the person, if you are planting the trees there, and you've been there for 50 years or 60 years, there is some remunerations that you will find after you've done that hard labor. Otherwise, they're not, they have no interest in investing in doing that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, there are, are several other issues confronting Haiti. and. One, uh, uh, briefly, there's a cholera, there's a cholera epidemic outbreak. What is the status of that now? That's, that, was, that killed four or five, 6,000 people, yes. as I recall. What, where are we on that? Well, yeah, in fact, Haiti never had the cholera before until the UN came in and came with the Nepalese uh, uh, contingency that came in and they dumped the waste in the river. And you know, because of the infra infrastructure of lack of sanitation in Haiti, a lot of people use the river water for drinking, bathing, and that's how they, they caught uh, uh, cholera. But I think the good thing about cholera is that it has been able to be contained. Uh, the epidemic started, there were, uh, people were very scared, they were afraid, and it would have destroyed the majority of the Haitian population. But wha what has happened is that the World Health Institute, uh, WHO, and various other institutions, CDC, uh, came together and were able to support bringing the mm -hmm. clean water, uh, uh, other programs to help the people, a lot of education about people washing their hands, a lot of this process. So cholera has been on the downside, uh, reduced considerably. Uh, the other thing that has happened also is that the UN has, has realized that, and the international organizations have realized that if they don't do infrastructure work, such as bringing clean and safe water to towns, cholera will come back again. So there's a big effort now in various communities to bring clean drinking water to people so that they can prevent them from catching cholera. Mm -hmm. Clean water is absolutely essential, it yes. really is. Now there's a large Haitian community living in the United States and in other countries too, but in the U.S. there are tens of thousands of Haitians around. I guess it was 2006, I believe you wrote a book, Haitians in New York City, 
transnationalism and hometown associations. Do you talk about what Haitians are doing to help Haiti, to help uh, as a diaspora to perhaps provide remittances to Haitians or to provide their technical expertise to go back to help the country to uplift itself and to improve its quality of life and standard of living? Yes, in fact, one of the fascinating thing that I'm always interested in is citizen participation. Because I think at, at the core of a democratic government is the involvement of the people. I'm, I'm truly believe in uh, the Tocqueville, you know, mm -hmm. view of America and how people voluntarily take on some chores that the uh, the, the state they didn't expect the state to do for them. And I think what has happened with the Haitians living in the United States, they've learned really how the system, the U.S. work. In other words, you don't depend on the government to come and do for you. So a lot of them have been it together coming from their hometowns in Haiti. And now they come together to do development and support work in their hometown. So they would raise money in the United States and go off to their hometowns in Haiti to either fence the cemetery, feed children, bring some economic projects, build a, a school, build a hospital. And in the process of doing that, they are organizing the population itself because they have to have meetings, they have to find a consensus, they have to vote on issues, they have to have reports, they have to have minutes. So suddenly people begin to realize that there can be other ways to organize yourself instead of just staying and depending on the state to do things for you. <laughs> so I think the hometown associations have played a major role in bringing a, form, a new form of citizen participation in Haiti and also making the local towns responsible for their own development. And I think this is a very good thing for the for Haitians in New York because it gives them a purpose to be connected to Haiti. And for Haitians in Haiti, it allows them to, to share some of the skills and social capital that the Haitians here have that they don't have in Haiti because of the 30 years of the Duvali regime that really mm -hmm. cut off the circulation between Haitians abroad and Haitians in Haiti. Mm -hmm. And of course, the thing back to uh, Francois Papadoc, Duvalier and Jean-Claude, his son, that was, that was a, uh, really a very difficult time for a large number of Haitians with a very, really uh, vicious dictatorship that was operating in Haiti. Is the democratic process taking hold? You mentioned there were challenges to that, but uh, are, is uh, democratic governance actually moving forward? Well, it has its, a lot of bumps, more bumps than we expected. But one of the things that I think that has happened over the years is that uh, people have claimed it as their own. The right to free speech, the right to assemble, the right to have a different opinion than what the government says, and, and also the right to question what governmental authorities are doing. And I think one of the things that happened also is that uh, during the Duvali year, you could not organize. You couldn't have civic associations. You couldn't have anything that would be against the government. Everything had to be sanctioned by the government. Today, people can organize on their own. Unfortunately, they organize themselves, but they don't have the resources to carry on the programs that they would like to do, because the state still is not putting the money into the to the uh, bring into the population and putting it into the communities. The state is still like uh, keeping the money onto itself and centralizing a lot of the process. And I think the next phase in the democratic process is to completely decentralize the process so individual communities can have means mm -hmm. to achieve their objectives. And uh, the last, the hardest question probably, what do you think or what are two of the things that could be done today to be of greater assistance to the people of Haiti and to help them get their lives back on track to recover from this earthquake and to develop more economic and social prosperity? I, I think it, um, it, it sounds very hard, but I think it's doable. The first thing is put the money in the communities and let the people decide. Obviously, you don't let them on their own. You provide them with technical assistance with support system so that they can manage the money and decentralize the process. Right now what you have is that everything that comes to Haiti goes straight to the government in one way, whatever it goes. The other part of it goes to the NGOs, mostly the international NGOs. Or the problem with the international NGOs is that when they come in, they come with huge salary base, they come with experts who do not stay long enough in the country to understand the country. The move, the rotation is so high and so active that people barely understand what's going on in the country. And the third thing is that the NGOs are not really accountable to the population. So usually people are on the receiving end instead of being participatory in the process. 
So if we can change that around, that first you ask people what do they want instead of saying this is what should go be good for you, then it would be a difference. And secondly, we have to look at Haiti and say, okay, if people are hungry, there is no way they can start thinking about democracy. The first thing we have to do is deal with hunger. We have to deal with the process of how could you be a, a country the way you have most of the agricultural lands laying fallow, no one is working on them, and you have no support system to do it. So you have to start developing agriculture. Mm -hmm. You have to start putting the money into the, the community and keep the, uh, the overheads very low so that it, the, all the money doesn't go into high-end salaries. What has happened after the earthquake is that the bulk of the money went into paying experts who would create plans that they know themselves they would never be there to execute those plans. So those plans never go anywhere, mm -hmm. but the money is wasted. Exactly. Well, Dr. Francois Pierre-Louis, you've really encapsulated a tremendous amount of information in a very short time frame, and we could go for another 30, yes. 40, 50 minutes or even a day or two to talk about the unique challenges to Haiti. It's a country of great interest to the people in the Western Hemisphere and the Caribbean area of the United States, Central America, South America, but I think to people around the world. But I do want to thank you so very much for a very thank interesting very and a very informative program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.